We're live. Yate, Shio, hello, and welcome to our second presentation of our Indigenous Speaker Series, specifically focused on the Pacific Northwest. My name is Nancy Maryboy, and I am the founding president and executive director of the Indigenous Education Institute. I'm Diné and Cherokee, and have been working in the area of Indigenous traditional knowledge and education for many years. The Indigenous Education Institute, IEI, along with the San Juan Island National Historical Park and the Madrona Institute, is proud and honored to present a sense of place, Indigenous perspectives of earth, water, and sky in the Pacific Northwest. Over the past three years, we've presented eight sessions of our original speaker series, featuring renowned Indigenous speakers from around the United States and Canada. And now I'm honored and pleased to continue this new series focused on the Indigenous people and the environments of the Pacific Northwest. I would like to begin today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the Indigenous peoples of our Mother Earth to honor our many participants from around the world. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities and the pandemic of COVID-19, we wish to honor all indigenous peoples from all around the world. I also want to acknowledge that I currently reside on the ancestral lands of the saltwater salmon people of the Salish Sea who have called this place home since time immemorial. I honor the inherent and acquired treaty rights of these indigenous peoples. To continue our Pacific Northwest series, we are so honored to bring you Rena Priest, the poet laureate of Washington State to be our second speaker. Rena is a member of the Lummi Nation and a remarkable poet. When I say we, I mean the Indigenous Education Institute, or IEI, which is a nonprofit institution with an all Indigenous board and staff. We've been in existence for over 25 years. We are located on the San Juan Island, Washington, and on the Navajo Nation. Our mission is to preserve, protect, and apply traditional Indigenous ways of knowing to contemporary life with a focus on native education, environmental change, and sustainable, healthy environments on the earth, the water, and in the skies. Much of our work concerns the creation of collaborations with integrity uh, between Western science and traditional indigenous ways of knowing. The presentations in this series have been chosen to reflect an awareness of the foundations of indigenous knowledge an awareness of the traditional living and thinking. In our native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, heliophysics, or other separate disciplines, we will be presenting dynamic worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. Another focus for this speaker series is expanding awareness and understanding for cultural differences to support more successful and diverse working relationships, whether it be in education, national resource management, NASA, museums and science centers, or tribal communities. I would like to personally thank you for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is overwhelming. We have over 450 people registered from all across the United States. And we have participants from around the world as well, including Canada, from British Columbia to Newfoundland, and the United Kingdom, South Africa, Costa Rica, Mexico, Indonesia, and Botswana. Uh, it's also interesting and especially heartwarming for me that we have more than 100 
and nine tribes represented in our registrations for this presentation today, and more than 150 Indigenous participants. Most of, our most of our presentations for the sense of place, indigenous perspectives on earth, water, and sky presentations have been recorded and can be accessed at the Indigenous Education Institute website shortly following the event. Since you all have registered by email, we will also share notices to you for upcoming presentations. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Rena Priest. Rena Priest is a poet and an enrolled member of the Locked Lummi Nation. She has been appointed to serve as the Washington State Poet Laureate for the term of April 2021 to 2023. She's the 222 Maxine Cushing Gray Distinguished Writing Fellow, a Vadon Foundation Fellow, and a receipt of an Allied Arts Foundation Professional Poets Award. Her debut collection, Patriarchy Blues, was published by Moonpath Press and received an American Book Award. Her second collection, Sublime Subliminal, was published as the finalist for the Floating Bridge Press Chapbook Award. She's also a National Geographic Explorer 2018 to 2020, and a Jack Straw writer, 2019. Rena Priest holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. And now um, I'm going to turn it over to our star poet, Rena Priest. Aishka, thank you, Nancy, for the beautiful introduction. Now CEM Ohi Luxon Kwanasatla Tia Kaya Sahwal Tanat Sanasnat Chakulomisan. Uh just so happy to be here. And I'd also like to extend a thanks to the uh, Washington State Arts Commission and Humanities Washington for all of the work that they do to bring the Poet Laureate program and, and all of the other programming that they uh, coordinate to the residents of Washington State. Um, so I'll start off with a poem that is also a land acknowledgement and it's called Welcome to Indian Country. I suppose before that, I'm gonna drop a link into, um, I'm gonna drop a link into the chat for anyone who's interested in how to find um, the, whose who's land you're on. <laughs> and we can go ahead and I'll do a screen share too. Um, and, and we can just preview it for a second if that sounds good. And then we'll start. Let's see here. Well, maybe, maybe I'll let you explore that after, but I'll just, uh, I'll go ahead and launch into the poetry reading and, and we can talk about that later. But this poem acknowledges that the entire Western Hemisphere is Indian country and it's called Welcome to Indian Country. So um, I'll start out with two poems from my first collection, uh, which have a lot of my poems include sciency, uh, like I guess scientific ephemera and things that I find fascinating. And I'll talk a little bit about why later, but because um, the question kind of comes up often about why the, why the science in my poems all the time. And I have a good answer for that. So uh, this first poem is called Van der Waals Force. You take my hand, look at my fingerprints and ask, did I ever tell you how a gecko sticks to the ceiling? You explain how gecko toes have grooves that turn into a forest of hairs, which have smaller sub hairs with a forest of smaller sub hairs and so on until at the very tips are atoms. So the gecko toe and the ceiling atoms are joined, become one momentarily indistinguishable. And it's so freaky cool, you say, the military has studied it, they've tried, but they can't manufacture anything like that. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's just kind of a little anecdote, but it's, it's, 
I find it really beautiful to think about connection and poetry often looks at connection and interconnection and metaphor, you know, being the tool of poetry is, uh, it does the work of finding connections between seemingly unconnected things, you know, how is a raven like a writing desk, right? <laughs> um, or a raven is a writing desk, um, even better. But so, so the idea that a gecko and the ceiling can be the same thing, it's science, but it's poetry and it's beautiful. And I think that much of the world is, you know, the creation that we live in together, the creation, the world is, is poetry um, manifest. The word poem actually, the word poet comes from the Greek um, poesis, which is to make. And so the job of the poet is to make the world and uh, making it through understanding and making it with our language, which is really beautiful. So this next poem, uh, also from my first collection, talks about the electron microscopes. Um, there's a really beautiful image of a blade of grass, a cross section of a blade of grass inside the, and it's looked at through an electron microscope and inside of it, you can see little smiley faces. It's so crazy. It's the craziest thing. I could, I'll, I'll try to find an image of that and show you um, in, during the Q&A possibly, but here's the poem. If I had the right kind of laser and you had an electron microscope, I could write secret love letters to you in the curve of a paper clip. They might be short little verses about the abundant nature of love. The paper clip might be holding together a movie script about the apocalypse and scarcity. Maybe when you pulled the message encoded paper clip from the script, every page would tumble away to be edited by wear and rough weather so that only the sweetest lines were legible. Only the words you and enough, and you are always enough. So that weeks later, when strangers on train platforms picked up the scraps gusted into their hair, they might feel as if they were getting love letters from the wind. Yes, the unseen, it's beautiful, right? Um, that it's there. And, and uh, we have new ways of seeing it. But I think that the ancestors, they had other ways of seeing it, in, intuition, deep reflection on systems and, um, you know, noticing, deep noticing, which is really what poetry is. And I think possibly what science is as well, um, having a strong interest in the world and wanting to understand it and connecting to it really. That, that beautiful connection. Um, this poem is called A Study of Light. The longest day is a study of light. When light behaves as discrete particles, it makes waves, but only when observed, or so I've heard. In my ancestral language, I recently learned the word for river is the same as the word for Milky Way. The light today is torrential unrelenting. It pours and I am caught in it. I can't stop it, so I lift my head and let it soak me while the luminous day goes on and on and on. So that poem was in a collection. It was an anthology collected by the Chuckanut Sandstone writers, um, and that's Carla Schaefer primarily responsible for that, but she she's a Bellingham poet who has coordinated the Chuckanut Sandstone Writers Reading Series for many years and um, just decided that we all ought to get together and um, write solstice poems. And so that was my summer solstice poem. But it talks about this uh, thing that I learned about. So I, again, I'm coming at you <laughs> as a lay person in the sciences. I'm a, I'm a poet, but I think it's all fascinating. Um, I learned about the double slit experiment, which says that if you shoot light particles through two slits, they'll make a, they'll disperse in a pattern against a screen and you can try to understand how they're moving through space. And um, the study showed that when you shoot them through the slits, they disperse along the back screen in a wave pattern 
but only when there's like a little camera observing them. And when they switch the camera off, they disperse as particles. And, uh, and, and apparently there's like a, a big prize and lots of fame and glory if you can explain that scientifically, like why that is. Um, but I think that, I, I think it's that light is conscious. <laughs> Um, I, that's, that's my scientific opinion. <laughs> um, and I think that something about the way the ancestors understood light to call the river of light in the sky, um, you know, the Milky Way is a river of light. It's, it's a stalo, just like a river. Um, that's the name for the Milky Way. They understood it like water as well, right? And, and water also can be a wave or a particle just the same as light. Um, anyway, so those are just some, some little thoughts there to give you an idea of where I'm coming from and where the poems come from and, and to, to talk about cool science. So uh, let's see here, this poem, sometimes people ask me, um, who my audience is, and it's different, I think, for every poem. But this poem is is for tribal youth and maybe just tribal people in general. And it's called Miraculous. The math has been done. The fact of your existence is 700 trillion to one, more or less. You've played the cosmic slot machine and won, struck the freaking jackpot, my friend. So are you a miracle? Yes, I'd say so, but I'd also say that remembering to put out my recycling on Wednesday is a miracle of equal magnitude. Or is it Tuesday? We must not be narrow in our definition of a miracle if we are to lead miraculous lives. The body believes in miracles. When you get goosebumps, it's the feeling of your body trying to grow hair really, really fast so that you don't get cold. Your body loves you will attempt a miracle to make you comfortable. If you can happen and I can happen, and we're all just mostly songs and bent light, then it stands to reason that hunger and war and all that difficult history and your heartaches and more can be eased by merciful, miraculous softness, right? So, the math actually has been done and there's different opinions about this. So there's like um, the idea that it's 700 trillion to one and, and it, you know, they've, break, they've broken down like, you know, generations of people and things like that. But then uh, I read a really good take on this that says that if you, um, if you rolled a like gajillion sided dice and everybody on the planet got the same number that would be like the odds of you being born but it's it's funny to think about the impossibility of a person's existence and yet here we all are right so um now i think uh let's see i'll 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 read you well i'll tell you a story so my role as a poet, I think, might be most similar to what traditional storytellers would have been. When I, when I was appointed as poet laureate, um, people would ask, what is the word for poet in your language? And I thought, gosh, I don't know. I should know this. So I went and I talked to my teachers, my Aksalas, and I asked, what's the word for poet? And they said, well, a shuyam is a story, and a tiwiyuch is a prayer, and a stilam is a song. And so it's a prayer, and it's a story, and it's a song. And this is how we uh, conveyed information. This is how we passed along technology. This is how we understood the world. The most important things was um, you know, teaching through stories and songs and, and ceremonies and, um, and, you know, and our prayers, of course. And that's what our songs and dances were often. They were prayers. And so this, this poem is called To Sing and Dance. And it gives a little bit of history. 
Uh, it has an epigraph by my great grandmother, Sadie Jones, who said, when I was a little girl, they wouldn't allow any Indian dancing. The spirit says, sing and dance for me and I will take care of you for all of your days. This must be the reason why for Indians to dance and sing was made a crime. We had to take it underground. On my res, singing and dancing were allowed, but only once a year on treaty day, when agents from the BIA were obliged to look the other way, so that we Indians could celebrate that treaty where the ancestors traded so much away in exchange for our lives. Otherwise, raids were made on ceremonial homes, sacred objects were seized, obliterated, or appropriated, for use as museum displays, meant to serve as proof that our nature-loving Indian ways were dead. How foolish was the BIA to think we wouldn't sing, to think we wouldn't dance in celebration of this beautiful world. For the spirit says, sing and dance for me and I will take care of you for all of your days. Voices lifted in songs of praise, foot souls whose every touch of the earth is the step of a joyful dance. These are the spirits that make wicked men afraid. So uh, I, I read that poem recently and someone said, well, I remember in 1972, there's a, there's a, a little a footnote and it says that our right to sing and dance was not fully restored until August 11th, 1978, when then President Carter signed into law the American Indian Religious Freedoms Act. Um, and so I, I feel that that was an important turning point um, because like I say, a lot of our songs and dances celebrated the natural world, but they, had, they carried instructions, our stories as well, carried instructions on how to care for, for our home and the other beings that we shared it with. Um, they were a technology, they, they carried, you know, and, um, about the values, the cultural values, right? Um, how to interact with each other, why it was important to interact with each other. They were, they were teaching tools um, and it wasn't just um, civics, it was, it was um, science and technology as well. And an explanation for why things are the, the way that they are. Um, so when the first salmon ceremony kind of came back, right? That's acknowledging that that sacred gift and so we can interact with it in that way that feels like it's honoring that gift um, rather than treating it as a as a resource to be exploited and and that's the importance of the ceremony and the storytelling and the song and the dance and I think that this is the lineage that I'm connected to as a poet um, I hope so <laughs> I hope I do it justice and so I'll tell you one of these stories. It's an old story. Um, it's not the creation story, but it's a story about Quilshan and Kwame. And Quilshan is known as Mount Baker. I don't know if Mr. Baker ever saw his mountain, but uh, the Lummi people, we called it Quilshan. And Kwame is Mount Rainier. And at one time they were together. And at some point along the way, Kwame decided she would leave. And she she wanted to move south, and so she uh, you know she went, and it was a big dramatic exit, and so there was you know crying, and there was all kinds of other drama and explosions, and the islands of the Salish Sea were made. This is how they came into being. Kwame, along her way, left the islands, and on each island, she left a gift for the people, and there were teachings that accompanied each of the gifts on like how to um, how to how to interact with the gift. So. On Lummi Island, for example, it's called Smamiach, which is the deer. This is the place of the deer. And um, uh, Vendovi Island was Panachwang, and this is where we harvested camas, and so on and so forth. So the place names also told of what to find in a particular place um, so that we had instructions on where to go harvest. <clears throat> and uh, Anyway, so then she got to where she is now and she settled. She decided she liked it down there by Tacoma. And 
every once in a while on a clear day like today, from here, you can look down the water and you can see, you can see Kwame down there standing so tall and beautiful and regal. And Quilshan will look and he'll admire her. And then she'll look up and she'll see him looking at her and she'll say, no. And then she'll draw the clouds around her and that's why it's raining here all the time. So, <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, the, the teaching stories back to that. This poem is called Sui Tu Iishatanakun. And it, that's the truly beautiful earth. And it talks about how the, guard, the, Sal the islands of the Salish Sea were uh, cared for the way one cares for a garden. This used to be a garden before the strangers came with strange beliefs. They claimed to be cursed with something they called original sin, but blessed with something else called dominion over the whole living earth. They tore apart the garden, insisted that the savage wilds be conquered and subdued in order to be improved. We are part of the earth, thus their belief that we too must be subdued. Have they forgotten this used to be a garden? On the seventh day, do they look upon their work and see that it is good? I think we need our old beliefs to guide us back to the garden beyond the gate, guarded by their angel with the fiery sword. This used to be a garden. I don't think the strangers knew how the garden grew, so carefully attuned to the rhythms and tones of the earth's own beautiful song sung for untold millennia before they came along. This used to be a garden. It fed us and loved us and we loved it. We still do, or at least the memory of it. I've heard it said that half histories are half truths and half truths are lies. Let me tell it to you whole. This used to be a garden. <clears throat> so, Sometimes I share these poems with my mom before I put them out into the world. And she, she's, for that one, she's like, you know, I was raised Catholic, she's Catholic. It's, um, she's, she's still very Catholic. It's not, it's, it's not, she worries for me being in the world questioning the tenets of Christianity in that way, or saying, you know, that our, our old beliefs are where the answers are. But I think that truly, to restore balance to uh, the natural systems of the planet, we can't live in a hierarchy that places mankind at the top, which is really what the tenets of Christianity are based on. Um, go forth and subdue and conquer the earth, right? That's, that's a biblical directive. Um, so that might feel uncomfortable, but I think that it's important to acknowledge. I heard it said so eloquently by a scholar of um, indigenous literatures who's, who's fairly well known. Uh, his name is Arnold Krupat and he teaches at Sarah Lawrence or well, he's retired now, but he uh, did a, an alumni Zoom class uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And I was so lucky to be able to participate in that. And uh, he talked about how in all of the creation stories that he's ever read, there's only one where mankind rises up out of the dust of the earth and then is alienated from everything around him. He said in all the other creation stories that he's read in, in the hundreds and hundreds of creation stories there, mankind rises up out of the dust of the earth and then learns how to interact and, and be in community with all of the other beings around around them. And I thought that was really a beautiful observation, especially coming from someone so knowledgeable. Anyway, so um, back to this idea about naming <clears throat> and creating the world through naming it. This is called A Poem is a Naming Ceremony. What has grown out of what has gone away the clear-cut patch has grown larger on the mountain. The rivers have grown murky with timber trash, and there's enough runoff cow manure to grow corn out there on the tide flats. I don't want to think about what has gone away. I want to meander and play and forget myself until I can grow a new me in place of all this grief. 
learn the language to see the cottonwood as quail at each, the dancing tree, the killer whales as quilchomachin, our relatives under the sea, the whole glorious landscape filled with meaning to end my grieving. When I was young, I was invited to learn Kulnukkin, the people's language, but I said no. I didn't understand. I thought I wanted to learn how to be rich. I didn't know that the only way to possess all the wealth of the world is by naming it. Here is bird song. Here is the kiss of a lover. Here's the feel of cold water at the peak of summer. I have spent my life with words trying to name a hint of what I lost by not learning my language. Estetumsen, tutatusen, estetumsen. Those last three words are, I'm doing my best, I'm still learning, I'm doing my best. And this is a, this is the gentleness that they teach with now, I think. Um, there used to be a lot of anxiety. Well, first for a long time, there was anxiety about teaching the language at all. <clears throat> because, and this is my grandparents' generation, because the, the older people didn't want the young people to be punished for speaking the language. And then my generation, and I think probably my mom's as well, the anxiety was that it would be taught wrong. But if you didn't <clears throat> you speak the language with the English accent and everything, it'll be lost, it'll be, it'll be corrupted in some way. And now I think the teaching is that it's important to learn it and to do your best. And, and I think that's a really good way to, a good way to do it. <laughs> At least that's how my teachers approach it. They're very um, loving about it. It's very nice. Um, and this, this poem talks about the natural systems and how they're connected. In the previous poem, I talk about the tide flats and how they're, you know, they're, there's a lot of timber trash and cow manure, and you can't harvest shellfish in Lummi Bay anymore, um, or in some of the, in the Bellingham Bay, where we used to be able to harvest it because of the cow, cow manure that comes down and causes algae blooms. And, um, and so things that have been true for thousands of years are no longer true. This is called remembering Sila at Shwilisen. And Sila is the, is the word for grandmother. Shwilisen is the place name for where we used to harvest shellfish. And these are things that I remember her saying. This is another thing poetry does is it allows you to keep things. It, 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 it's like a personal archive. The important things go in poems and then you have them forever. <laughs> All right. so. We used to say, when the tide is out, the table is set. The earth provided, and if one day it didn't, the spirit fed us. The glittering turn of the tide, the arc of the sun in the sky, the call of birds, the sound of waves. To be nourished in this way makes glass doors opening and closing themselves between me and that food on grocery store shelves seem false, empty. That food, where does it come from? Whose hands grew it? Was there patience and care? Were there prayers? Think of how it got here, what it's made of. When I was a girl, everything we ate came from the earth that loved us through hands of people we loved. Excuse me. And, and that's, you know, looking at food sovereignty and how important our connection to our food really is to our health and well being. There are minerals in the dirt they found that cause, ha that like bring happiness, that are vital to our like health and well being. And to be interacting in the dirt that way is, you know, something that we don't have when we, everything comes from a grocery store shelf. Um, so I try to do something in the way of food sovereignty regularly. We, we call it feeding our Indian. I try to feed my Indian as often as I can, even if it's just going out and finding a salmon dairy in the woods somewhere. <laughs> salmon dairies, they're so good, right? It's the time of year for them. I guess I'll read that poem. Let me find that poem. I have one about a salmon dairy. Gosh, it's almost time to start Q&A and I have so many poems that I would, was going to share with you, but here we go. 
Tour of a Salmonberry. A salmonberry is a luminous spiral, a golden basket woven of sunshine, water, and bird song. I'm told that the birds sing so sweet because of all the berries they eat, and that is how you can have a sweet voice too. In my native language, the word for salmonberry is alila. In Sanskrit, lila means God plays. Salmonberries sometimes look that way. Every year they debut, spectacular in the landscape, worthy of their genus name, Rubus spectabilis, meaning red sight worth seeing. Each druplet holds a seed and the shimmering secret kept by rain of how to rise, float above the earth, feel the sun, and return. So talking about how poems can be archives, right? Um, this idea that if you eat a lot of berries, you'll sing real sweet. Uh, that's from my great grandfather, Grandpa Casmer, who I never met, but my mom has lots of stories about him. And so every year during berry season, she, she recounts this. And so every year I've heard that that's how to have a sweet singing voice. <laughs> um, and um, naming things, right? That Rubus spectabilis, red sight worth seeing is the name for a salmon berry. And they do, they glitter, they glitter out there in the landscape. I was recently talking to someone, she was talking about how there's a lot of light in my in, in my poems and water um, and glittering. And she was asking where that comes from. And I, it comes from, I was young and I think it was Timothy Leary. It might've not, it might've been from somewhere else but I got to see Timothy Leary talk at Western Washington University when I think I was like 16 years old. And he was talking about how light, um, how our eyes are, are attracted to light. And I'm pretty sure it was him about how water, it's because we're evolved to seek water, right? And when you cut fruit, it glitters and water glitters. And, um, and, and this is why we, we possibly seek gold and jewelry and things like that, things that glitter. <laughs> interesting. So this poem is called The Frolicsome Crests and Glistening with an epigraph by Walt Whitman who says, what is it then between us? There are 20 million pounds of gold suspended in normal seawater spread out in parts per trillion. Gold is a good conductor of electricity, but seeing how it's sought, I'll bet it's the best conductor of a heart's deepest want. I once had a conversation with my daughter in which she asked, do you believe everything is connected? That depends, I said. On what, she asked. On whether you're being spiritual or conspiratorial. Spiritual, she said. Then yes, I said, everything is connected. How can everything be connected spiritually but not conspiratorially, she asked. Considering it, I believe the spirit conspires against our errant belief that we are separate. I might be you. You might be me, we might be the living sea with 20 million pounds of gold shimmering suspended between us, conducting our heart's deepest wants across frolicsome crests and glistening. And what else could it be if not a spiritual conspiracy? Okay, so I think I'll pause there and see uh, if we want to have a conversation and if there's a uh, you know, if I want to answer a question with a poem, I do that sometimes because that's, that's um, how I, how I, I think, do. Rina, I think you have more time than you think. I think our, oh. our timing on the pages was wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. About um, 15 or 20 more minutes to read some poetry. Okay, great, cool. Yeah, that there was a question I just saw in the chat. The last poem is called The Frolicsome Crests and Glistening. Okay, cool. All right, well, I'll read some more then. Um, this poem, let's see, how about this one? This is, a, this is kind of a fun one. We'll do this. Let's go into the dark a little. <laughs> this is one of the things too about poetry is it allows you to like go into topics that are heavy while still being approachable, right? This is called Tiny Robots. Watch a tiny robot powered by alcohol. This is a dystopian novel about how politicians make decisions. 
Watch a Tiny Robot, Powered by Alcohol. This is the title of a memoir about surviving a shitty divorce. Sorry, the, the, the bad word. <laughs> Uh, watch a tiny robot powered by alcohol. This is a biopic about R2-D2's off-screen bond with Carrie Fisher. Watch a tiny robot powered by alcohol. This is the title of a poem about the machine of modern society. Watch a tiny robot powered by alcohol. This is the headline of a science article about robots replacing bees. The last one is true. It's very dark. Um, yeah, the, the the article is "Watch a Tiny Robot." That's that's the headline. "Watch a Tiny Robot Powered by Alcohol," and then it gives you um, a really grim picture about these little tiny robots that they're they've designed in order to be pollinators in the event that bees go extinct. And I just I read it and I was like, oh my god. It's so dark. It's so dark. Could it be about anything else? And so the poem was inspired by wanting that article headline to be anything else but what it actually is. Um, anyhow, okay. This one's called Words of Encouragement while we're on the topic of extinction. has an epigraph by W.S. Merwin, who says, one must always pretend something among the dying. And that's from his poem on a coming extinction. When writing poems about extinction, it's important that you make the poems deep, but uplifting. Nobody wants to read a bummer poem about endangered orcas and their dead babies. Keep it light. Keep it motivational, encouraging. It's important to accommodate your gentle reader. Don't say anything about how if you won't swim in it, why should they have to live in it? Don't say that. Honesty is offensive in this day and age. It's always been offensive. How else do you suppose we got here? Maybe instead of saying something like, the orcas and salmon are going extinct because of ordinary greed and apathy, say something like, the noble creature with his power and grace shall journey away forever through the portals of time. Good taste. Omits mention of baby orcas abducted to be theme park clowns, decades in chlorinated cages taking their eyes, how during the capture, so many died. Don't forget to forget what you know about human cruelty. How the baby orcas that didn't survive had their bellies slit and filled with stones, then were sewn closed and dumped into the sea to sink into a silence so dark and so deep, public outrage couldn't reach a depth unfathomable as a mother's grief, too heavy to carry for one day, much less 17. Among the dying shall we pretend that in the end, we too shall not be listed among the dead. Yes, let's pretend when writing poems about extinction. So that poem, um, I wrote that sort of in response. There's, there's a big uh, thing when, when Lummi was first starting to talk about wanting to try to repatriate the Southern resident orca that's in Miami, um, Tokatai, she's still there. I think Lummi's still trying to campaign for her return. But at the start of that effort, um, I was approached by a political strategist and, you know, he said, maybe you want to write a poem about this and, but don't make it, don't make it dark. <laughs> I was like, and it was um, it was sort of about Tokatai's return, but it was also about the tour of grief, the 17 day um, tour of grief that uh, J35 took her her calf on um, that we all sort of watched in horror. Um, but I I just thought, oh, it's such a it's this is the problem, right? The political strategist says, don't make it really dark. Just you know, make it uplifting. And it's like, okay. 
we're talking about like extinction and the unlawful, unlawful, or you know, unjust imprisonment of an orca in a in a theme park. <laughs> but don't make it dark. Um, and so, uh, so you know, that was that was my response. And it appeared in For Love of Orcas, which was a beautiful anthology collected by an Orcas Island poet named Jill McCabe Johnson, whose work I really admire. And that collection ended up winning the Nautilus Award, which is an, an, it, it's a, an award given for environmental writing. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's do this one. This one's called Round Dance. I've heard that a triangle is the strongest shape. Okay, perhaps, but a circle will always circle back. For its reliable tenacity, nature loves a circle. A circle is relentless. We've been going in circles on this rock for eons, a fractal making songs as generations spin along, spinning out new variations with each turn in the cycle new tyrants, new saviors, new hungers, new flavors, new yet patently familiar. A drum is a circle, a community is a circle, a yurt, a turret, an igloo, a powwow, a pantoum, the hero's journey, a day, a year, the tides, the moon, an iris, a pupil, a nipple, a breast, one circle, a ripple into the next, an ovum, a cell, splitting like an atom, exploding, growing, arms, legs, joys, griefs, ascending and circling back back, back, all the way back to the tomb. Dust and ash, you'll be back. Energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed. Is it a comfort or a horror? It's both, it's everything, and it would be overwhelming. But here we are again, where we retract to void. Relax, let the song hold you wrapped. Nature loves the circle. Uh, yeah, the circle of days, right? I mentioned in that poem, Pantooms, and I um, just, it's a form that I really love. It's a really old Persian form. It, I have um, five pantooms in this book that just came out. It's called Northwest Know How Beaches, and uh, it's on Sasquatch. It's for, out from Sasquatch Books. And you can request it at any bookstore if you're interested. But I chose the pantoum form for the poems in this collection. Or in oh, it's not it's not all poems. There's only five poems. It's just um, a lot of descriptions of beaches. I visited 34 beaches and wrote about them. And so they're all in here. You know, I, I was out in the islands. I was down on the coast, and um, the beaches featured stretch from Samyamu up at the Canadian border all the way down to uh, the southern part of the Oregon coast, Sunset, Sunset Bay State Park, um, which people always ask, what was your favorite beach? That was my favorite beach. It was Sunset Bay State Park because uh, when the tide is out a little ways, you can see um, the root system of an, of an ancient forest. Uh, that had been submerged by a sudden geological drop. Um, they thought initially that it had occurred over a long time that the forest had just kind of slowly sank into the into the sea um, and all the trees of course died. But after further study, they think it was like a sudden drastic event that happened that caused everything, you know, the, the land base to shift so drastically. Anyway, it's really beautiful. You can see these root systems and you can go stand in the root systems of these huge trees that have been there for um, over a thousand years. And the cool thing too about it is that there's, it's like in a little cove and you can see there's like a, there's like a break, a natural breakwater of rocks. And so you can hear the waves roaring out at the, um, at the distant from the ocean, but then you can hear the nice soft little waves uh, in the from the bay coming in, and it, it sounds really interesting. It's like a song sung in rounds, and so um, all of the 
poems in this book are pantoums because the pantoum form repeats like waves. The lines, they come in waves and they repeat. And I'll read two, I'll read two of the poems in this book. Um, one is called Beach Party, thinking about geological formations. For, for untold ages, these pebbles here have danced, twirling in the clamor of waves, softening in the surf. Each turn and flourish, a patient, passionate churn of advances and retreats timed to the music of tides. Twirling in the clamor of waves, softening in the surf, each stone has a history, its own slow story of origin, of advances and retreats, timed to the music of tides, arisen from the molten earth to break away anew. Each stone has a history, its own slow story of origin, millions of years to begin, millions more to end, arisen from the molten earth to break away anew, free to tumble and roll, untethered but never alone. Millions of years to begin, millions more to end on the shore with millions of friends and time to spend, free to tumble and roll, untethered but never alone, at this effervescent party where water touches land, on the shore with millions of friends and time to spend. Each turn and flourish a patient, passionate churn at this effervescent party where water touches land. For untold ages, these pebbles here have danced. Okay, this one's called Beach Fire, and then I'll read one more, and then we'll do a, a conversation. Beach Fire. Measure wealth by how well you enjoy the hours, fluttering by in praise of sunshine and the ocean breeze, whispering love songs across waves that kiss the beach. This wealth takes work and absolutely no work at all, fluttering by in praise of sunshine and the ocean breeze. Don't mistake leisure for laziness. This gratitude is rigorous. This wealth takes work and absolutely no work at all. This gift of a moment to be alive, to feel at peace. Don't mistake leisure for laziness. This gratitude is rigorous to be filled up and satisfied by a day at the beach. This gift of a moment to be alive, to feel at peace. It means your heart fire flames a lovely heat to be filled up and satisfied by a day at the beach. You could toast marshmallows by that warmth. It means your heart fire flames a lovely heat. The glowing embers, a boundless source of power. You could toast marshmallows by that warmth, whispering love songs across waves that kiss the beach. The glowing embers, a boundless source of power. Measure well by how well you enjoy the hours. Okay, let's see here. I have one that I want to share to close us off. And I thought it was at the top, but it's never the case, is it? <laughs> okay, here we go. So the title of the collection that these poems are from, which is un most of these are unpublished. Um, the collection is called Dancing to the Ticking of the Doomsday Clock. And uh, well, I'll read that poem too, and then I'll read this one, okay. <laughs> and then we'll talk. They're both pretty short. So the doomsday clock. I don't know if you know this, but scientists have made an image because, you know, it's important to be able to have an image to understand where exactly we're at. <laughs> In reality, they've made an image called the doomsday clock and every year they kind of update it to see, you know, where we are. And this year we're 100 seconds to midnight. At 100 seconds to midnight, the revelry is dazzling. We are all enchanted and enchanting with our fiery delusions of the glory of man. Oh, how we dance like no one is watching because they're not. Oh, how we dance like it's the end of the world because it is. 
The doomsday clock now says 100 seconds to midnight and still the party is blazing. Some species are waning, several others have gone. But we're still here, now grown to 8 billion strong. Will our neighbors be glad when the clock strikes 12 and our hot mess is quelled? allowing them to carry on undisturbed in their own meek and beautiful business. Will they miss us? Who knows? <laughs> uh, so people um, sometimes ask like, what is a, what is a vision forward, uh, you know, in, in, response to questions about the poems about extinction and you know the doomsday clock and things like that is there is there a way for what's the way forward <laughs> and I always think well I don't know that it's as much as it's not imagining it's it's remembering for indigenous peoples it's remembering and it wasn't that long ago you know, I have that poem where I talk remembering Sila at Shwilisen and she says when I was a girl Everything we ate came from the earth that loved us through the hands of people we loved. And I was listening to um, Rex Buck, who is a Wanapum tribal member. I was watching a video of him talking about um, how everything was there on the prairie. You had food, you had medicine, it was all there. And then, you know, they put grazing animals there and it all got tore up and and then it wasn't there anymore. And I thought, gosh, you know, he remembers it in his lifetime, had all of, it was all there. My grandmother remembered it in her lifetime, it was all there. And I think it could be there. And it was as simple as, you know, for him, it was as simple as, and then they put grazing animals there and they tore it all up and then it wasn't there anymore, right? And so for us, it's the same thing. And then they put grazing animals upstream and, and all the cow poo made it so we can't actually go harvest clams anymore in, the, in that one instance, in that one poem. So the answer is there, we have it. It's, a, it's, it's not imagining, it's remembering and then having the collective will to, um, to have it be what it was again, if, it, if it's possible. And nature is so powerful and so resilient. I think it is. And this poem is called Before Clocks. To keep time meant music, the steady rhythm of a beat, the playful plucking of a string, the full throb of a drum sounding to the steps of feet. To keep time meant stillness, the steady passing of a day, no need for rush or delay in the fluid timeline of one's own way. To keep time meant tides, the waxing and waning of the moon, the easy pace of later and soon, the warmth of the sun declaring high noon. To keep time meant seasons, the rippling rings of a tree, the changing disposition of the sea, the migration of harvests leading us to where we need to be. And it always happened right on schedule. So and here we are right on schedule at the part where uh, we'll, we'll have a chat or um, if you're sticking around, we'll have a chat or, uh, you know, I'll answer questions and we can, we can go go a little improv -y here <laughs> okay oh rena thank you every word in the native languages thanks you and this is i just wish it could go on for hours and hours and days and days it's it it just made me fall in love with poetry and your poems all over again uh, it's such a beautiful way to see the world and the cosmos and the universe. And I'm reading some of the comments that have come in. They're really wonderful. Um, it's it's so inspiring. It's wonderful. I I don't. You're the poet. I don't have the words. Um, well, let's. Um, I want to um, just thank you first so much. And we do have some questions. They've come in under Q and A, and they've come under chats, and and um, I know Kai has some. So I'm going to introduce Kai Sanborn, who will field some of the questions that were included in the registrations, and also came from the audience today. 
Um, and uh, we don't take any calls directly from participants. We take them from the, the ones that have been written in. So I'll turn it over to Kai to ask a few questions and then Rena, anything else you want to add or, or poems you'd like to read again? We, we have about um, we have 20 or 30 minutes if we want for the Q&A, but that's usually an exciting time. And um, I know Rena has been looking forward to this. So I will turn it over to Kai and Rena. Thank you so much again, Nancy. This has been delightful to be invited here to be with you all today. Um, first of all, I share the gratitude that's been streaming through the chat um, for your words and um, your ability to make us laugh, move me close to tears and give a lot of people reported goosebumps. So thank you for that. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to just make sure, where are your poems available? I know you have three books that you've mentioned. Is that is that correct? And were most of the poems you read today in those three books? Are they published or there? Yeah, so the first two that I read, well, so the first one, Welcome to Indian Country, um, I'm uh, that one will, that one's forthcoming um, in poetry. And uh, the one, the first two that I read, Van der Waals Force and the one about the electron microscope are available in my first book, Patriarchy Blues. And then the rest of them, everything else that I read is from the new collection. I guess the last two poems, the, the two poems, um, the Pantoums, the Beach Fire and Beach Party are available in Northwest Know How Beaches. All three of my books are available on my website, which is just renapriest.com, and it's on the books tab. And so um, you can order, uh, I, have, I have it set up so you can order the Beaches book directly from Sasquatch. You can order um, Patriarchy Blues from Village Books, which is uh, the local bookstore here in Bellingham that we all just love so well. You want to support them. And then also, um, the Sublime Subliminal collection is available directly from Floating Bridge Press, which is a 501c3, um, a, a nonprofit press that has, it just does wonderful work. Um, the lead editor there, Michael Schmelzer, is, is super cool and really passionate about the work he does. But previously, it was headed by Kathleen Flanagan, who was the Poet Laureate of Washington State from 2012 to 2014. And it's just a really um, great resource that we have here in Washington State for poets. Thank you. And I, I'm going off script here, but you had mentioned when we spoke earlier with Nancy, um, an indigenous poet gathering. Was that right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, could you share something about that? Because that was inspiring. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, so this year in in April during National Poetry Month, I got to be a part of a cohort. It was the, the inaugural cohort of Indigenous Nations Poets, which is um, an organization that is headed by um, poet Kimberly Blazer, and she uh, and her and her team collected, you know, faculty and uh, and fellows. And we gathered in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress for a week of fellowship. And we did workshops and, you know, um, all, we just did a lot of talking about poetry and indigenous poetry and, and just it was really amazing um, being in that group. But the really cool thing, too, is we got to go to Joy Harjo's closing ceremonies as she was leaving her role as Poet Laureate of the United States. And that was so special. Um, you know, she came the first night that we were there, she came and she had dinner with us and I was starstruck. I was so nervous. <laughs> I was like, you know, I, I just think I have this thing where like every time I get in conversation with a, one of my heroes, I immediately say something awkward. <laughs> so, um, this was no exception. I started talking about the new hair product, <laughs> the hair product I was using. And I was like, Rena, just stop. This is Joy Harjo, say something profound. And of course, you know, it just kind of got more on my part, more awkward from there, but she was so gracious. She was so wonderful. Um, and then uh, in her 
in her closing speech, she said something that I, it just made me start crying because um, she was talking about how her path into poetry was, you know, was a zigzag as I'm sure it is for a lot of poets because it doesn't seem like an obvious choice for a career path <laughs> in this in, during, in these times right um so she was talking about being an artist and she was in art school and she decided to change her mind and go um study poetry and she said that, that was a hard decision and people looked at her like she was crazy because you know in a in a community where basic services are like you know desperately needed she's studying poetry and she said but I did that because I wanted to write poems to, so that people would see indigenous peoples as human beings. And I, that just like made me start crying because this is why, you know, I feel maybe I want to write poetry. Um, and, and so that would just really was very resonant. And then um, the very last thing that she wanted to do as poet laureate was have a dance party on the steps of the Library of Congress. And so we did, and it was really special. It was a really joyous and beautiful occasion. And I'll, I'll have those memories forever and ever and ever. Um, it's just amazing. So hopefully I'll get to be involved in the upcoming years, um, planning for the upcoming cohorts and things like that. It's been busy for me here, but um, I definitely want to keep a hold of all of those people that were there with me. So yeah, great time. Um, yeah, and just a, I think that we may be able to collect questions that we are not able to answer in the time frame and, and respond, send them out by email. I want to check that that's true with Nancy. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, we can do that. And I, um, this has come up, I was going to say it in a few minutes, but I'll say it now. This, this wonderful presentation has been recorded. And you and as soon as um, Chris Taren is able to put it up, um, it'll probably be in less than a week or so. It will be available on our website for Indigenous Education Institute. And um, Chris, maybe you can just post that. I, I, he already did. <laughs> um, you can see it there. Um, HTTP dot dot slash slash indigenous education dot org um, slash multimedia. And you'll find um, all of the ones we have done nationally, plus the Pacific Northwest the only one we weren't able to record was John Harrington, the Chickasaw, the first Native American astronaut. And that was due to some arrangements he had with his publicist. So every all the other recordings are available. It's free. You can download them. And people um, that I so admire, like Robin Kimmerer, for example, was our second speaker, th third speaker, whatever. She um, actually go, went back in and uses people's other, other speakers um, presentations in her own classes up in New York State. So um, these 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 wonderful um, speakers have a life. It goes on and on through the website. So um, feel free to go in and listen to them. And I am going to listen to Rena's again several times now. Um, I finally had to go out and get a piece of art from um, from Lummy, an old old piece. Uh, that I have had in my house and just so I could stare at something that instead of just my kitchen or um, the chats or something, I could look at something and and tie it in with what she was saying. So um, it, it, this has been an incredible occasion. I, we still have a couple of minutes for and questions. No, and I do have some questions. I just wanted to get that clarification. Yeah. Is that okay, Nancy? Yes, and let me introduce you too, because I got so caught, caught up in this, I forgot. Um, Kai is what we call an ally, and she's a wonderful ally. She's a non-Native American who has just dedicated a lot of her life to what we're all trying to do up here and all across the United States and all across the world, which is giving voice, a really authentic voice to Native Americans to say what, what needs to be said. And that includes us at the Indigenous Education Institute. It includes Rena. It includes many, many of you that are on this recording. So um, she's been lovely to help out with the um, canoe journeys and many other different things. And she is from Lopez Island. So let me put it back to you, Kai. Thank you, Nancy. That's very generous, um, what you just said. Um, Rena, you 
as a poet, you take clearly take uh, inspiration from science to tell your deepest stories. Um, do you have a do you have a sense of how your poetry can flip that and help science and STEM programs tell their stories? And that was kind of a hybrid question from several people. Yeah, I think that um, when I teach poetry workshops, I one of the things that I do, I a prompt that I use is. Um, to do a free write about something in the natural world that puzzles or fascinates you. And I think that this helps people, you know, poets are become scientists when you do that, right? Because this is, this is, this is the act is um, looking at the world. And so the things in science that are um, fascinating or that I find like really cool I, you know, I always just in general want to write about them. Um, I even like the language. There's richness in the language, um, genus names and things like that coming from the Latin or, or the Greek. And um, well, even like, you know, the, the, the idea that a droplet, that a salmon berry, all of those little globes on a berry, those are called a droplet. <laughs> there's language for everything right so there's like definitely like a, a a place where poetry and science mesh and they you know the language if it can be um accessed that the the rich language and concepts in science can be accessed and given through poetry i feel like that's where it would happen much more than prose because in prose um you know you're you're bound by explaining and uh, I don't know I mean I, I suppose you sort of are in poetry too but there's a lot more freedom and you can just say whatever you're going to say and then and and then um your aim is to really connect like uh, I think it was Philip Larkin that said a poem is a machine that takes what I'm thinking and feeling and puts it in you across mm -hmm. time and space and that and I really like that explanation for it and so um understanding science intuitively rather than technically, I think is something that poetry can definitely help with. And, and do you feel that there is some um, receptiveness in the science communities that you've been bumped into or do- I always kind of wonder. <laughs> I'm like, do they think I'm just like a goofball? Like I, I read Vanderwall's Force to a scientist recently and she's like, I love it that you called it that. That's so cute. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, well, um, but, but, uh, but like people, it's my hope that, you know, like from this base, from, from this initial encounter, people might go and try to understand it more. I had this really cool experience recently. I had this poem called The Glimmer and it talks about the turning of the tides. And here, I'll just read it to you. And then I'll talk about what I learned about the tides. I'll read both of these actually, um, because they're both interesting here, let's see. Well, not the poem, but the concepts within them <laughs> are super interesting, which I suppose makes for a good poem. Okay, this one's called The Glimmer. From darkness, the idea of a self, blood, water, a soul, my body, a brief victory over death by making breaths, thoughts and actions, a series of moments expressed, a cup filled with bliss and the movement of breath, pulling itself into emptiness, water between stones, disappearing, how quickly it goes. I leave with my breath, I return with my breath, and I understand the tides. They are spun in currents by the exchange of breath. For kisses branded on flesh, we claim each with each, join names to our tongues, weld our memories to breath. In our chests, each moment dies for the next, singeing shut the spaces between each allotted breath, smelting our lives first into glitter, then into ash in this breathtaking glimmer above death, 
where we make breath. So <laughs> in there, I talk about how uh, I understand the ties that they're spun in currents by the exchange of breath. And of course, that's not true, but it's a poetic statement. And so, you know, we're just going to say whatever we want to say because it's poetry. But I read a poem recently by Scott Ferry. I blurbed his book and it's his, his, his new book is coming out in September and it's called The Long Shadow of Days the Long Blade of Days Ahead. I think that's the title of it. And it's a really beautiful book, but there's a, a poem in there that talks about how tides actually work. And apparently, I mean, I'm this many years old and I didn't know that it's that like there's the, the moon. I knew it had something to do with the moon, but I didn't, didn't really understand that the moon is over here and that the earth circles and the, the pull of the water like stays. It just kind of stay or, you know, and see, I'm doing a terrible job of explaining this. He does a much better job in his poem of explaining it. Um, but, you know, we, we pass through the bulge of water made by the, the moon and that the big minus tides and the and plus tides. So I was like, no way. So I had to go and research this, right? Which is what I hope people will do when they, when they read my sometimes uh, naive statements about science that I include in my poems is that they'll like go and do their own research and find out more. But um, that the big minus and plus tides are from when the sun is also pulling together with the moon and, you know, anyway. So that just kind of blew my mind and was super exciting for me to understand it. And I, I never would have like, gone and actually looked up to try to understand how the tides work except that I had read this in a poem and it was it was captivating um, the way that Scott offered it through poetry and so that's that's my hope is that like when I say something in poems um, it might be kind of a very childlike understanding of the scientific concept but that people will come to it and be like okay cool um you know uh and then and then getting down to what science shows us that everything is connected mm -hmm. and and i love um indigenous ways of knowing it like acknowledging the unseen or things that are not provable right like you can see how the system works and that's the proof but to try to you know, that that's acknowledged and that the spirit of a thing is acknowledged um, as well is it's kind of nice um, and I think that science in some disciplines it it moves in that direction somehow I don't know maybe not see here again I'm talking like from a layperson standpoint from a, from the perspective of a poet but all the time I'm learning things about the world and and they're just really fascinating and interesting this one is um called the known location of the soul the train ride is cumbersome and I think of the handsome Kurdish man in Germany when I felt motion sickness, he held me and told me, it's a symptom of your soul not keeping pace with your body. Later, I relayed this to another lover who said, no, it's from the bones of your inner ear not being able to match what you're seeing with what you're doing. <laughs> then your soul is in your inner ear, I said. <laughs> no, he said. Yes, I said. And that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that we discover things right like i the, the motion sickness it's it's your inner ear but but also if you take it from another perspective and it's your soul not keeping pace with your body then your soul is definitely in your inner ear <laughs> well there have been People, some go ahead merit nancy Oh, I was just going to say, um, there were a lot of scientists on this um, particular uh, uh, presentation today, and they were just wowed um, and probably are still on and are still wowed about this. I think what we're doing at IEI now, this was our first time, and it's just, you're just brilliant. And and um, we, we want to um, in, have in this series more people explaining 
or or talking about the interconnection of all things that the native way of looking at um of of the universe um but in terms of poetry and then we're also going to have in terms of art where you don't even have words you you have you have visual images and so um it seems like poetry and 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 the uh, physical arts are able to cross over these boundaries really, really smoothly and get to the heart of what's what's really real. And I think that's what we've seen in your presentation today. It's just, um, it's such a wonderful way to bring together indigenous ways of knowing and the language and science and just what we know from living our, our everyday lives. and. Um, without uh, without these more artificial boundaries that we keep putting around us. So uh, I just wanted to say that. Um, um, I think in terms of time, Rena, if you would like to just read one more poem and then I'll close this out. But what a wonderful time this has been, spending time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really been wonderful. Someone asked too, there was a question that came in before about um, poets that I admire and who I find inspirational. And you know who does this really well, talks about like the interconnection, about interconnection in the natural world is Linda Hogan. She's amazing. Her um, book, The Radiant Lives of the Animals. I read that over the summer and I got to talk to her about it. And it was just like a real pleasure. She's amazing. Um, um, she's a friend of mine, and I've asked her to be on this series, actually. So thank you for putting that out there so everybody will get a chance to look forward to it. Yeah, she's just incredible. I, I love her work so much. It's so beautiful and, and inspiring. Okay, so this poem is called Resonance, and it has an epigraph by Anaxagoras. He says, all things were together. The mind came and arranged them. The flicker of a wave on the sea is a flame, not like a candle on a cake, keeping tally of our days. Instead, the fire measures life together by the sweetness of resonance. How exalted by the dawn, we as one have sung our true song, become a single voice across the waves. The wax of a candle begins inside the humming darkness of a hive. But before that, it begins as sunlight, calling forth blossoms, pollen, and bees. Bees who play matchmaker to trees, calling forth fruit to become new seeds. Where does love begin? It is a surprise, but obvious and easy, like breathing. It has been here all along, a flicker on the sea that swam up from the deep to touch air and light, shine like fire to leap from its element the way a tree becomes a boat so that the earth can leap into the sea and sail toward adventure. Things are changed, things transform. This is the way the mind arranged it. The mind comes and arranges. The heart draws it all back toward union, washes away the illusion of separateness, gives new measures for happiness a new way to celebrate the state of being of one heart and one mind, Ait Hutchning, our song is a ferry that joins two shores. And so just to talk a little bit about that before we close, the term Ait Hutchning, it translates in Chlomichasen to good feelings. Um, but I was told by my teachers that that is the more direct way to understand it is that a good feeling is um, when your heart and your mind are in resonance. There's no conflict between what you think and what you feel. And when you're in that state with other people around you, you can create beautiful, beautiful things um, and things being connected and changing and transforming. I talk about how a boat, uh, a tree becomes a boat so it can leap into the sea and sail toward adventure. And that is actually a belief. Um, the people, when you, when a tree was felled to make a house post or a canoe, it didn't cease its life. It continued its life the way a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And it, 
a canoe is this new chosen life form of the tree and to spend that life with the family if you were a family with a canoe it was a very special gift it was a special thing um, that the tree had chosen you to continue its life with so um with that, um, thinking about science and poetry and resonance and there being a connection between what we think and what we feel. And uh, I'll just say that this has been a wonderful time and I really loved being here with you all and talking about poetry and sharing my work. So thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll be sure to read the comments. I sort of glanced down and saw some, some of them and, um, we're, we're kind of like going along here and um, I'd like to be able to respond, but thank you all so much for, for all of the kind words and for having me here with you today. Aishka. Thank you so much. Um, I hate to see this draw to a close, but I know we're all gonna wake, walk away with poetry ringing in our souls and in our hearts and have a better day because of it. So many, many thanks. I, I do want to mention that all of these, I'll mention it again, all, all of this um, wonderful time we've spent with Rena has been recorded and it will be on our website. Chris just posted it again, but it's um, indigenouseducation.org and you'll be able to um, download it with no cost and listen to this as many times as you want. Um, I also want to extend a very special thank you to our technical support, Chris Terran of Terran Solutions, Friday Harbor. Um, each time we host one of these speakers, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that you'll never see. But have you noticed that every time a question or something comes up, he's always the next thing that's on the chat has addressed it and uh, or put up the link. And so um, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes in these, um, this series. So I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, the coyote factor, um, that is in Navajo, we call it um, the disruptor or bringing of chaos. It's something similar to the uh, raven up here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, is always lurking somewhere behind the screens. And Chris is the one that always comes up with a plan B or a plan C to counter the possible chaos. So thank you, Chris, for all that you do. And thank you, Kai, for being on this with your questions and, and wonderful presence. And Rena, we've thanked you over and over and I'll thank you again. I also want to thank our sponsors today who include um, the Madrona Institute and its director, Ron Z. I want to thank San Juan Islands National Historical Park under the strong leadership and inspired stewardship of the superintendent Alexis Friedi and the park cultural anthropologist and liaison to the tribes, Joe Dolan. And finally, I'd also like to thank um, one of our sponsors, which is NASA on, for the NASA HEAT, the Heliophysics Division of NASA. That, um, David and I and IEI are contracted with um, for their support. So um, I think that's all. We'll, we'll close this and wish you all a very happy day, week, month, and year. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>